come to Brownsville Revival School of Ministry unless you're serious. <laughs> there is a fire burning out there at that school. And I just thought on, I thought for this night, on Thursday night of the pastor's conference, it would be really, really great if they would just open up the service for us and lead us in some things. Now, I want to tell you something. God was moving in the prayer meeting just a minute ago. So you just need to unbuckle. And uh, you need to just shake all the religion off. Just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. And how many, how many pastors or preachers are here tonight? All right. All right. Now, I want to, I not only want to welcome, but I want to tell you something. I'm giving you a night off. Okay. Tonight, you're not a pastor. You're not a preacher. You don't have to look at what's going on and make sure it's all of God, okay? You're not, you, hey, listen, you're not in your home church. We'll have a pastor out here in just a minute or two, and he's going to watch over everything for you. So what I want you to do is just be a little child in the presence of the Father, and let's worship him, okay? Are you all ready?
God, it's our prayer that you pour your spirit out over all of your creation. It is our prayer tonight, Father God, that you would touch our congregation, touch our people, touch our cities and our towns and our nations. Pour your spirit out, pour your glory out, oh God.
about who's around you. And release your spirit right now to the Lord. Come on. Release your spirit. Churches, Lord, the cold stone buildings, Lord, the edifices built to yesterday, the monuments of man. Let the wind of God blow, let it blow, let it blow, let a new sound arise from the bride of Christ as we worship, we worship the land.
Some of you visiting tonight, keep going, guys, don't stop. Some of you visiting tonight, I know this is kind of strange to you. But you see, I believe worship is about to take a, a severe right turn. I believe that. Because I'm certain that what we've been doing for several years is not what's going on in heaven because the scripture says in heaven they all worshiped and the 24 elders fell before the Lord and cast their crowns at his feet and I saw a mighty host and they all sang and shout holy 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 is the lamb worship is more than a few songs and I want to invite you tonight because the Lord is here and I sense the glory of God in this place. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to work something up. We're past all that. But I want to tell you something. God wants to heal you tonight. And he wants to touch you. But you need to forget about everything you know right now about worship and lose yourself. If you're visiting from a church that doesn't worship like this, it's okay. Because when we get in heaven, I'm not sure how we're going to worship. But I know it's going to be everything we've got. I want you to focus your attention on the Lord and all you musicians out there, you need to forget about the music right now because worship is not about music. It's about the Father. It's about the glory of the Lord. Oh, and all you theologians need to forget about whether this is theologically sound because there is a host of heaven that sings holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. And I just wonder what would happen tonight if we would focus our attention on the Lord and we'd forget about everything we got planned for the next 20, 30 minutes and all these thousands of people in this place and on the other, play, other building across the street would just focus your attention on the glory of the Lord, the Lamb that was slain, the one that is worthy.
Just your voice, lift it, lift it.
I want you to realize, whoever you are here, that you're in a room filled with people who have the same problems that you have, and the same temptations that you have, and the same struggles that you have. But we have Jesus in common. Yes! And he's put the devil under our feet! Now, uh, there's something on my heart we're going to do in a moment here. And uh, we're going to have you stand back up in a minute. But if you are not a student in the School of Ministry or a graduate of the School of Ministry or a family member of a student, would you sit down? All right? And students and everybody else, we got you squeezed in here in the balcony all around the borders here all up here yes lord now i i want you to just remain well most of you guys have no choice but to remain standing 
Everybody else remain sitting for a minute, then we're going to have you stand back up. But uh, we've got our, our faculty here tonight. I just want to call up one faculty member, John Cobb, our missions director. Let me, let me just say this to our, our visitors in Overflow and to all of the delegates at the Pastors Conference. This is not a difficult bunch to pour your life into. This, this is a group worth living for and dying for. And uh, John, just, uh, we, we've got a heart, we, we've got, well, let's, let's just ask this with everybody. You'll have to look around to take this in because we've got all our folks on the borders. But how many of you on a weekly basis are involved in one facet of local evangelism or another would you raise your hands in terms of our students here let's look all over here on the balcony i put your hands back down how how many of you and please give an honest answer here how many of you to the best of your knowledge in terms of what you saw in front of your eyes have seen people genuinely come to jesus in local outreach so far this semester would you raise your hands i'm talking about in the streets and the prisons nursing homes door to door Thank you, Lord. Now, in, in, a, in a minute, we're going to have everybody stand again, and we're going to do something insane. But there's never been any law. Th this is not exactly a fire marshal's dream, this, this crowd in here at the moment. So uh, soon enough, we've got to send our overflow students back, back over into the, into the chapel. And, uh, but John, just give a two- or three-minute blurb highlight of some of what's happened as, as these Young people and older people have gone out on missions trips, and you gave me about a 10-second one earlier that got me charged. But just, just l let the folks know, because here, listen, between all of us and, and the leadership team here, you'll hear it perpetually from Steve leading, leading the way. You'll, you'll hear it perpetually. But we're jealous for one thing, obviously the glory of God, number one, the reputation of Jesus. But in terms of what's produced in revival, we're jealous for one thing only, and that's lasting fruit. It doesn't matter how many people cried at these altars. If they went out of here, the same doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many fall, fell and shook or whatever. If they walk out of here the same way, it doesn't matter. Let me take it further. If six months or a year or two or three or four down the line, you cannot see the fruit of their encounter with God here, we don't care much for that either. It's got to be lasting fruit. Steve would talk about it all the time in the mission field in Argentina where their church is planted. What's the fruit of the labors once you leave? What can you come back to and look at? And it's not just enough to talk about how many have been converted, and, and you're going to see something that will astound you in a moment, how many have been converted through the revival, but how many are going on, and how many are bearing fruit, and how many are making a difference where they go. So we have workers being raised up to go to the mission field and throughout the cities of America. How, how many of you here in our student body honestly feel called of the Lord to spend a significant portion of your life or the rest of your life serving God in foreign missions? Do you just raise your hand? And just look around here good two-thirds of the student body and a lot of them have have, la have prayed it through and, and laid it down in their thinking if it means I die in the mission field if it means if it means I live a hundred years there whatever I'm going after souls so just just give a little synopsis of what's this is ongoing fruit produced through the revival Jesus is building his church amen Hallelujah. I'll be as quick as I can but there's so many firebrands and revivals and movements and souls getting saved all over the place, it's not easy to condense this thing. But when you talk about revival breakouts in Guadalajara, moves of God in Wales, okay, South Italy has been shaken, all right, with outbursts and healings and people getting saved. We were just there, tents packed out, people hungry for God, drug addicts getting saved, people coming off the streets, homosexuals being converted, transvestites turning to the Lord. Hallelujah. Shoo. Hallelujah. We were in Nigeria in the beginning of this year, and uh, we were able to bring four kings to the Lord. Okay? And uh, one king, his kingdom was over a million people, and now he's having Sunday night services every night in his palace, and he's ordered all his people to convert over to Jesus Christ. Go! Hallelujah! 
Hallelujah. You know, we're so excited that the fires of revival and taking the nations is totally transportable. It goes back to your home church. It goes back to foreign nations. And our students, the fruit of the revival, they got it. You know, they've got it. They carry it with them. And we just send them everywhere. We just heard back from Thailand. Our meetings there, we had uh, about 150 people get saved one night. Then we had healings break out in the villages. And a whole town was turned around. I mean, these things are happening. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. The gospel is right. Amen. The kingdom of God is battering the gates of hell. And so I just encourage you, you know, as you're here, leaders and pastors and visitors, uh, there's something going on. You know, sometimes the critics say, well, what about this and what about that? Well, what about all the souls that are getting saved all over the world? Hallelujah. Hey, one thing, uh, in case you didn't figure it out, John is our missions director in our school. But uh, what happened in Nigeria when the guys went to the village and demons started speaking through people? Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, they, one woman demon-possessed started uh, writhing on the floor, and they were, they were trying to get this demon out of her. Maybe some of you don't believe in that, but it happens. <laughs> they, they were say, and uh, they, they were saying, this woman was saying, or should I say the demon through the woman, was saying, why did you bring the fire people here? Why did you bring the fire people here? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One thing we tell our students, you may go in a tough area and sow with tears for years before you see a convert. And we bring people from the suffering church to share about hardship. And, and, and students understand it's not just a picnic out there. What's neat is the tougher the place we bring them, it seems the more quickly they want to go back. And, and I believe this is a generation that's ready for a challenge. Amen? Now, if everybody would stand up to your feet, that's the only way you're going to be able to see. Now, this is crazy. Steve and I agreed on it. So if you have to blame anybody, blame us. But uh, you may wonder, and, and listen, there's only one reason we're doing what we're doing. Thursday nights in the Revival Hour are led by the, the School of Ministry. And uh, this is part of our, our worship team up here and uh, our choir. And we'll pack the place out, and then our, our visitors are always coming. We're ministering to them. We're looking to bring the lost in. And, uh, and, and tonight we're just serving in, in, the, in the larger conference along with, with Lendl and, and the team here. But uh, there's only one reason we're doing what we're doing. I, I'm happy to tell you about the school and tell you, pastors, leaders, send your folks here. We'll send them back to you with a blazing fire and a heart to serve. And we tell them constantly, three keys. I said, when you leave the school, I don't want you to be known for faith or revival or fire or power. I want you to be known for humility and service and sacrifice. And if those things are, are in your spirit, the fire's in you here, the passion's here, you'll go out and make a difference for God. But I'm not doing this to promote the school, although I never mind promoting the school. And I'm not doing this to promote the revival. And I'm not doing this to lift up Steve Hill. I'm doing this to encourage you Everyone that's here, visitors, and everyone, especially for the pastor's conference, sometimes you don't see a lot of fruit and you get discouraged. We've all been through it, every one of us. And, and, and then someone seems to come to the Lord, but they don't stick, or they, there's no lasting difference in their lives. Or years later, you look around and say, well, is it real? I heard about a move here and a move there and a move there. Where's the fruit of it? Is it real? I want to encourage your hearts. If you've been struggling, the enemy's been attacking you, or you're in a tough area, I want to encourage your hearts. The same Jesus, the same spirit here is working everywhere. Now, now, students, listen carefully, all right? And, and our grads that are here, too. This is not for family members of students, but just students and grads. If you have been, if Jesus saved you through the revival, or you were away from God, you were backslid, and Jesus brought you back to himself through the revival, a video from the revival, or hearing Steve preach here, or one of the other, Wake America Outreach. So Jesus saved you or brought you back to him through the revival, or you were seriously addicted. You may have been in and out of church, but you were addicted, drug addicted, sex addicted. I don't just mean you had a problem, but you were seriously addicted. So either saved, brought back to God, or, or supernaturally delivered. Jesus did it for you through the revival. You're now in the school of ministry. You're a graduate. Would you come and join us on the platform, in case there are one or two of you that that applies to, okay? And just, uh, just squeeze in as 
just in case it's more than three or four or five or. Squeeze in close. Keep squeezing in. Move forward. Any others? Keep coming. Fill the front here. Thank you, Lord. Keep, keep coming. Squeeze Get right across the front here. Right across the front here. We got some more coming. Thank you, Jesus. Keep coming. Now, I'm, I didn't ask how many were believers that were a little lethargic and Jesus really set them on fire. I didn't ask that. Or how many were awakened to a sense of calling. Didn't, this is converts, backsliders, backsliders coming back. And uh, among people up here, there are former drug dealers, former strippers, for people that were in jail. Every background. Uh, how, how many of you were, were uh, Jesus delivered you from drugs or alcohol to the revival? Would you raise your hands? Thank you, Lord. How many did he deliver from satanic activity, Satanism, witchcraft, occult, any of those backgrounds? Raise your hands. Thank you, Lord. How many were completely away from God, lost or completely backslidden when Jesus touched you and got hold of you? Thank you, Lord. And uh, how many of you feel called to tear up the devil's kingdom? Hallelujah. There's a, one of Steve's favorite expressions that you often hear is, uh, take that devil. And uh, now hang, hang on. And uh, there's, a, there's something in the Bible called the shout. And uh, I'm a Hebrew scholar, and if you study it out in Hebrew, it's louder in Hebrew than it is in English. Trust me. You can't make it a nice, quiet Presbyterian shout. It doesn't work. It's, it's a shout. But uh, we, we kind of like to worship and, and really sometimes really shout at, uh, at the school. And uh, I think God feels it's all right. And uh, I, I just want to say this in honor of the Lord Jesus, whom we serve and who's the author of all good fruit. He's the only one that gets credit and glory for it. I, I'd just like to say in very polite, quiet terms, which can be followed by a holy exclamation point. Take that, devil. Jesus! 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 Woo! We love you, Lord. Thank you for salvation, deliverance, forgiveness, freedom, purpose, call. Hallelujah. Well, everyone that's got a seat, why don't you take it? Bless you, folks. We love you with everything in us. Those that need to go back over to the overflow, those don't have a seat in here, you can make your way back. They're, they're helping me with my southern terminology. They're fixing to sit down now. They reckon I will. They reckon they will. Bless the Lord. When I, as folks are, are heading back, let me say this. When I first came here, Stephen invited me to visit. When we talked in January of 96, I was eager to see what God was doing here. And finally, May of 96, I came down. And I don't know if you remember this, Steve. You probably don't. But that very first night, I, I had seen the, the videos with Charity singing Mercy Seat. And... Uh, you know, little Charity who's getting married next year, who's a young lady now. And uh, 
at seeing Alice and Elizabeth's testimonies. Many of you have seen them when they were the, the Ward sisters. They're now both married. And one of the first things I asked him, how, how's that little girl, Char how's Charity doing? And what, a, what about those sisters? How are Because I wanted to find out. You know, we hear enough testimonies. And then, you know, who is, where is the person healed of cancer? Oh, you mean the one we just had the funeral for last week? Well, what, 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 all those converts. I mean, you said 300 people were converted in the meetings last month. Well, well where are they? Um, well, we, um, it was exciting meetings, but no, where are the converts? And all the people who were delivered, how are they doing? I mean, that's, that's what we live to see. And as pastors, that's what you live to see. An investment in people's lives that's going to last for generations and generations. And uh, hear me now. There are a lot of keys to that. Discipleship and follow-up is a key. But one of the biggest keys is people need to get saved right. Amen? When they get saved right, they'll live right. And in order to get saved right, they need to hear right message. Amen? When people just raise their hand to say, okay, I'll give Jesus a try. Yeah, you try him out for a week, it doesn't work, you go on to something else. But when you have an encounter with the Holy God, repent of sin, and Jesus lifts that burden off and forgives you and enlists you in his service, it's a whole different ballgame. And, and the problem in many of our churches is we're trying to disciple unconverted people, or as I call it, the semi-saved. When people get what Steve calls, so saved, then it's a joy to work with them. Amen? We want to give you an opportunity now to, to worship the Lord with your giving. Let me just please say, appreciate the enthusiasm, that's all right. You can be excited. But all the delegates at the pastor's conference, you've already registered to be here, and please feel no obligation to give. If you say, hey, I love to give, it's not a burden. I, are you kidding me? I want to get behind the work here. It's my joy. It's a heavenly investment. We don't want to stop you from that, but please feel no obligation to give. And everyone out that else that's here, students, I know you guys are rich. I know you guys have a lot of money. And this is a great opportunity to give. And all of our visitors, I don't know any better investment you can make with your money. If you put it in the bank, you get a certain amount of interest. If you invest it in stocks, you may get some money back. But you make an investment in the kingdom of God, and you're going to yield the fruit of souls in heaven. And lives dramatically changed. And a lot of the people up here are here, and, and they're here because someone gave. Someone gave and enabled bills to be paid and services to be held. Nobody here on the platform takes salary or, or, or income money for, from, uh, from the church here and, and, and uh, from, the, uh, from the offerings. This doesn't go to anybody up here. This just goes to undergird the work of this church. So visitors that are here and, and friends of the revival, let me encourage you to give with generosity. And, uh, and as you give, if you're visiting, uh, please don't put your tithe in here. If you say, man, I got some tithe money in, in my checkbook and I've been holding on to it because I haven't wanted to give it to my home church, give it to your home church, honor God. This revival has always stated clearly that we don't want your tithes here. So you bless the home church and you honor God in that. But we ask you to give an offering above and beyond that. And, uh, and let's glorify the Lord with our giving. And those that give out of need, those that give out of financial pressure, remember that we serve a generous God. Remember, it's not just a trite saying, you really can't outgive God. So give by faith, give to honor the Lord, make an investment in souls. And, and there are people who, who sat right where you sit, and in the overflow sat right there, gave their money. And because they gave their money, they're going to get part of the reward in these souls for the rest of their lives, because they gave and helped them get saved. So let's given to the Lord. If you're making out a check, make it to Brownsville Assembly, and all the money will go to the ongoing work of the ministry in the church here. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of giving. I pray, Lord, those under financial pressure, those with great needs, that you would shower blessings upon. And Lord, those here in ministry and the laborers and delegates, Lord, some of them need a miracle. And Father, I pray you'd reach down and grant them a miracle. Some have nothing to give at all, Lord, and they're dependent on you. Lord God, be gracious to them and help and pour out blessing, Father, through this offering. May it result in a greater harvest of souls than we have ever seen. In Jesus' name, amen. While we're receiving the offering, I'm going to do something. Go ahead, guys. I'm going to do something. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble with some Brownsville folks. My parents are leaving in the morning. Where's my mother? Are you here, Mom? Where are you? Come here. This is my mom. 
And that's my son crying after her because she left him. I get in trouble with Miss Shirley Robertson and certain Brownsville folks if I don't have this lady sing while she's here. Make sure you can hear yourself and just say hello while you're here. Praise the Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place so mightily tonight. Praise God.
Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. to the poor to stand. Everyone in the overflow wants you to stand also. Those of you at home, we want you to stand to your feet. want everyone to stand. I believe this is a divine appointment. I believe God has set this up. I believe that I've got a message tonight from the Lord. God knows how to prepare the heart for the message and the message for the heart. In just a few minutes, Charity is going to be singing Mercy Seat. Those of you that are away from God, you can get right with God. But right now, we're going to pray. We're going to ask Jesus to speak to us and to change our lives. Friends, I want to tell you before I preach tonight, I am so burdened down. I am so heavy. This is so heavy on my heart. When you pray this prayer tonight, I want you to pray this sincerely. As a matter of fact, this is what I want everyone to do. 
this is, you know, these are unusual weeks. Pastors' conferences are, for an evangelist, it's a very difficult week for me. It's probably the week that I do not look forward to the most because people read on the website that there's a pastor's conference, so they, a lot of people don't come to the revival. And I love ministers, but I also, I love sinners more. And so it hurts, it hurts that there are people, you know, there's, there's hundreds of people that would have normally come, but we're having a pastor's conference instead. Now, there's people here that don't know the Lord. I rejoice that you're here. But I also jo rejoice in the fact that God's given me the opportunity to invest in the life of ministers. And, but I want you to do something right now. Those of you that have badges, whether you are a minister at the school, uh, at this uh, conference, or you're a school of ministry, I want you to take your badge off. I want you to take it off. Everyone take your badges off in the overflow. And I want you to put it away. Those of you that are listening through the audio phones, I want you to take your badges off. Please, translators, it's being translated tonight into nine different languages. I ask in every one of those languages, you tell them to take their badge off and put it away. There's a purpose for that because tonight, as, as I share, nobody is anybody. We're all in the same boat. Now, now that your badges are off, I want everyone to pray this prayer with me out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart, change my life, change my life. in your precious name, your precious name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, you'll probably notice tonight if you're up front that I have one of my eyes is, um, is red. It's red right here. So I want everyone to say, Steve, your eye is red. Okay, ready? Steve, your eye is red. Thank you very much. Now, get over it. Okay? I have, it's a trip, man. People, it's like when you stand in the sun here for a little while, you know, and you stand for an hour in the sun and you're beat red. For the next two or three days, all you hear is, you've been in the sun. 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 You've been, they know they've been in the sun. Say something different like, my, you're looking red today or something. Hallelujah. I'll tell you where this came from. Yesterday I did something very unusual. Reinhard Bonnke is doing a film He's spending millions of dollars on this particular f series. He's probably recording 2,000 hours of footage. The people that he's using, those of you that were in the conference and you saw the film crew here, that film crew is one of the most sought after film crews in the world. It's, they are sought at, Steve, Steven Spielberg gets these guys that were here last night to edit his films to look through his stuff. That's how professional these guys are. As they travel around the world, they're always being uh, assaulted by actors who want them to review their work, and these guys are just tremendous, incredible producers. And uh, Reinhard Bonnke has got on his heart a desire to put a fire conference, of which I've worked with him in these fire conferences, and I'm gonna do some in the future with him. Uh, he wants to he wants to satellite the Word of God into 1.5 billion homes. The man is a visionary. He's got vision. He wants people to be saved. And um, so this film crew is here. They filmed us in Germany. They, this is an example of what they do. Reinhardt wanted, wanted, to, um, he, he wanted to talk about the fire of the Lord. So this man put Reinhardt in a helicopter and flew him inside a volcano and had him get outside the helicopter. And then he said, okay, now let's talk about fire. As a molten lava underneath the helicopter was just bubbling, they talked about the fire of the Lord. And so that's the kind of quality when this does come out, and it may not come out for another year or two, when it does come out, please get it. And uh, I don't know exactly how they're going to do it. Technology keeps changing. But I'm sure you'll be able to satellite it into your church. You'll be able to purchase videos. But it's going to be a phenomenal, 
phenomenal fire conference. And I was doing some filming for three and a half hours yesterday. We did filming out on my property. And um, the whole time they were filming, I was moving. They had me moving. The film cameras were moving backwards and I was moving. We have 40 acres and they just kept walking across the property. They kept the whole thing moving. And they had me share my testimony. They had me share testimonies of changed lives. They, had, they, they, they told me, they said, all, I, all we want is truth. We just want truth. Just pour your guts out to us. Just pour your heart out. And, um, and I kept crying. And um, they knew my testimony. And see, I've been saved for um, 24 years now. And it's as real today as it was 24 years ago. And when I share about what Jesus has done, it tears me to shreds. And when I share about what God's done in the lives of others, and so we filmed for two hours. He said, okay, Steve, we got from you something we never get from anybody. We got the highs. He said, the passion is on film. Now he said, try as hard as you can to go through the whole thing without weeping. And so we walked all the way to the other side of the property. And I said, you're going to have to stop me because I can't do this. You're asking me to act, and I'm not an actor. So what they had to do, they had to, um, they're just weaving it in and out, and uh, they, wanted, they wanted some of the cutting edge talking, and then they wanted some of the weeping, and just to be able to weave it all together. The man knows, I mean, I did not argue with him. I mean, I wouldn't argue with Spielberg on how to make a movie. And if this guy gets counsel from him, I mean, if Spielberg calls him for counsel, I got a feeling he knows what he's doing. And so I didn't argue with him, but that is when my eyes started getting irritated. It was outside. And so anyway, that is the whole story. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You have prayed and said, Lord, speak to my heart, change my life. I hope you meant it. For those of you that are here visiting the revival, you've never been here before. And uh, I had a man come to me a little while ago, and he, he said he came by and he, had, he said, I'm just coming to the revival. He says, who are all these people? And I said, well, there's a pastor's conference going on. And he didn't know there was a conference going on. And um, all these people walking around with badges on. So it's awkward to some people. If you are a rank sinner... I'm not talking about a so-so sinner. I'm talking about a rank sinner. Pastor's badges would scare you. Okay? So I've made it a little bit easier for rank sinners here tonight to just sit among us. And you may say, well, you know, do people like that really come to the revival? Folks, you have no clue. Tonight when Mike was listing, you know, asking people what they've been delivered of, I was sitting back there, Mike, and I was going, please, Jesus, don't have him get any deeper than what he's already gotten. That's what I was praying, that Mike would not get any deeper than what he had already gotten. Because if he started getting into some heavy deliverances, it had blown your minds what people have been delivered of. And I'm one of those, once you've been washed in the blood, you've been washed in the blood, you don't need to parade it. And so um, people come to this revival like that they come hurting they come wanting deliverance they come demon possessed and if you're here tonight demon possessed we welcome you and if you've come tonight and you're in the back row or maybe up in the balcony and you have a little john kilpatrick doll and you're sticking pins in it That's okay. We've had pastors, we've literally 
had people in the bushes out front hexing us as services were going on, casting spells on us. We've had people in the back row chanting with little rattles. It's wild, friend. And we always wel we welcome all the witches and warlocks, anyone like that, to the revival, and we tell them to keep their chanting down low as not to disturb the people around them. And then we remind them also, you're wasting your time because Jesus Christ, our... Our boss messed up your boss 2,000 years ago. Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, verse 1, called, say called, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are ye also the call say called the call of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be the saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ you ever written a letter that's like dear Bill <laughs> that's all that was that was just the beginning of the letter he starts it at verse 8 where he says first I thank my God through Jesus Christ then he goes into his letter but I read that this afternoon that is so rich and it says everything that needs to be said tonight I'm gonna talk to you tonight you can you can you can call this message the call and the fall the call and the fall the call and the fall this is not a negative message tonight at all it's not a negative message but today in the session I shared with the pastors and evangelists and lay leaders that are here that we are going to enter the greatest battle known in Christendom in the days ahead I do believe that we will come to a point in America where it will be common to shed blood. It will be hearing of a pastor or a lay leader killed for Christ. We've already seen martyrs. All those kids in Kentucky, remember what they were doing when they were slain. Those girls, those kids were in a prayer meeting. That's martyrdom. Plain and simple. If that was a football rally, they would have never been shot. And so there's coming a day where I believe violence is going to be known in America when it comes to a person's religious belief. And so um, I really want to lay a foundation for you tonight. For many years, I have shared with countless individuals the four proofs of a call to the ministry. People come to me and they say, Steve, I feel something. How do I know I'm called of God? Many of you here, you want to know, are you called or not of God to enter the ministry? That's a valid question, and it's one worthy of scrutiny of interrogation, of investigation, because I don't take the calling of God lightly. Jim Summers, who is on this platform right behind John Kilpatrick, wave at me, Jim, so they'll know who you are. This man tried to win me to Jesus back in 1969 
in Huntsville, Alabama during the Jesus Movement. Jim Summers had moved from Birmingham. He owned a business. He was a manager of a business, a very successful business. He was on his way up. I believe today he would be a multimillionaire. I don't share this to glorify Jim. I just believe these are the facts. Jim sold everything he owned, got into, a, I think, believe a Volkswagen bus, wasn't it? And drove his family up to Huntsville, and he started working with street people. He went from business, everything you want, to working with street people. He started ministering on the streets in Huntsville. This was during the Jesus Movement. And he started winning a lot of my friends to Jesus. I was mad at him because my friends were all drug addicts and they were getting saved. And he was the man responsible for it. So I went with a friend, Cleve Edwards. And Cleve, if you're watching this, Cleve is a pilot now with a major airlines. We talked the other day, Jim. He's a pilot. He saw me on television and um, got in touch with me. And uh, he and I went over to Jim's ministry and, and saw all our friends over there, and they're always saying to me, you know, Steve, you got to get saved. You got to get saved. All I wanted was some more drugs. Jim tried to minister to us. I didn't want anything to do with it, didn't want anything to do with him. I went on my way, and we didn't meet again for six more years when I was behind bars for selling narcotics, facing 25 years in the penitentiary. Jim is called of God. He's called of God. Jim got saved. The Lord dealt with him about lost souls. And he said, all to Jesus I surrender. Jesus, you can have my home, you can have my job, you can have my wealth, you can have my clothes. All I want is your favor. He was called of God. And that calling has brought him through the hard times and the, if I can say, the lean times and the fat times, the times when he had plenty. His calling has brought him through the time. You remember this, Jim, when your little boy, Tony, was riding a go-kart down the street and uh, was hit by a car, and everyone thought he was going to die. His calling brought him through that, the hard times. Keep in mind, friend, as I'm sharing tonight, when you look at someone like myself, John Kilpatrick, John Davis sitting there, some of us on this platform, when you look at us, this is not what it is, okay? People have been through them, th some things. When I look at you, I don't see you and go, oh, what a handsome man, what a lovely lady. I know that behind that skin are years and years and years of untold stories. And some of you have been in the ministry for years. Brother Larry Stockstill, that's the pastor's, where are you at, Larry? Pastor's one of the greatest churches in America. This man, when you go to his church, how many members are you running now, brother? 6,000 members. It's an awesome church. In the last six months, he had something like 850 people saved. In, 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 is that right? Six months, 850 people saved. This is America I'm talking about, okay? Okay? But when you see him, and you, you'll see him at the revival in his suit and with his son, and you look at him and you go, man, there he is. Man, he's got that great church. Nobody knows. The demons of hell he's had to fight. The negativism. The backlash from hell. Because he tried to do things that were impossible in the eyes of man, but possible in the eyes of God. It's called the call of God on Larry's life. And what I'm going to share with you tonight for the next few minutes, you better hide in your heart. Those of you that are watching this at home, those of you that have purchased this video, and someone sent it to you, sit down and listen to every word. Absorb it. I've spoken to many people on the four proofs of a call to the ministry. Number one was this, a sincere love of the Savior. 
Now I'm going through this quickly, so pay attention. A sincere love of the Savior. God would never call someone into his work without first recognizing his deep love for his son. He would never enlist a soldier who was not committed to the cause. So number one, everyone say number one. You want to prove to a call to the ministry, the first thing, you got to be saved. You've got a sincere love, and I underline sincere. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 24, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. That's Paul, and he knew what it was me meant to be sincere. So if you don't have a sincere love for the Savior, you can forget the rest of the points. I'm talking about the call of God. The next point was this, a deep sense of recognition that you are not your own. You are bought with a price. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A true Christian no longer calls the shots. There's somebody over you. You at one time did what you wanted to do. Listen, Bible school students, there was a time that nobody, the police, your parents, no one could tell you what to do. And then you got saved. And when you get saved, you fall under the authority of the commanding general. Jesus Christ says, soldier, front and center, now. But I'm I said now. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. You don't own yourself anymore. God owns you. Jim Summers had no choice. If he was going to be used of God, he was going to follow God's command. See, God had this Brownsville Revival plan way before Father's Day 95. He was planning it when you got saved. He was planning it when you were under the ministry of Brother Wetzel. When John Kilpatrick was being ministered to as a young boy, he was 14 years old when God called him. It was in a history class or something, wasn't it? A biology class in school that God called him to the ministry. See, God was preparing this revival years ago, putting all the ingredients. But what if one of these ingredients had chosen to not heed the call of God? What if Mike Brown had decided to not get serious about God when there was a revival in 1982 in your church? There would probably not be a revival school of ministry today. When you say, well, God would have raised up something, somebody else, I don't know. Maybe he would have done something just totally different. But he answered the call. Why? Mike Brown doesn't belong to Mike Brown anymore. Steve Hill doesn't belong to Steve Hill anymore. John Kilpatrick doesn't belong to John Kilpatrick anymore. John Davis doesn't belong to John Davis. Jim Summers doesn't belong to Jim Summers. We don't belong to each other anymore. We belong to Jesus. We're bought with a price. I want to tell you, friend, right now, Jim Summers didn't die for me. John Kilpatrick didn't die for me. Jesus shed his blood for me. He's the one that bought me. He bought me. He owns me. So you got to have a deep sense of recognition that you're not your own. Now right here, you're going to start seeing the separation between people that are called and not. Pastors, how many people in your church, you ask them to do something? There's always an alternative plan for them. You tell them, can you come and join us for prayer on Saturday morning? They say, I'm going fishing. We have, a fish, we have a picnic planned. My family's doing this. We're doing that. I'm doing this. I'm doing that.
God speaks to them in the middle of the night about getting up and praying. They lay their head back on the pillow and go back to sleep. Why? They don't understand they've been bought with a price. They don't belong to, they don't belong to Jesus. They still own self. Number three, a constant feeling of duty to be useful to God. A constant feeling of duty to be useful to God. Those of you that are in the conference, some of these notes are actually in your paper. Some of them. Just the points. A constant feeling of duty to be useful to God. You always want to be at his service. I'm talking about people that are called of God. I can show you people that are called of God just like this. You can smell them. You can see them. You can sense them when they're around. You know what they're doing? They're always hanging around you. And it's like, what do you want? Nothing. You want a glass of water? They say, uh, can I carry your briefcase? Can I mow your yard? Can I wash your car? Milton, are you here tonight? Milton, I want you to stand up. This man was saved in our crusade in Columbia back in 1992. Now he's graduated from the Bible school. He's going back as a missionary to Columbia. This guy right here, his father was an assassin in the mafia. His father was killed. You can sit down, Milton. His, his father was killed, was shot, and Milton wanted to be an assassin. He wanted to follow in his father's footsteps until a crazy evangelist set up a, a tent right down the street from his house in Palmetto, Columbia, and Milton came walking by one night. And I want to tell you what happened. He got so saved. He hung around us. He, you know what he said next? He said, what do I do? And I said, well, we're fasting. We're fasting through the whole crusade. And he said, what's that? I said, no eating. He said, okay. He shows up the next morning. Ready to go. No food. Ready to go. I said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to preach in the streets all day long. In the parks, in the plazas, everywhere we can go, we're going to preach. Okay. We're going to witness. And everywhere I go, man, he's just like a, a shadow. Everywhere you go. You don't have to go, Milton. You just go, Milton. He's right there. <laughs> That's why he's in the ministry. God called him. I could tell other people get saved and you won't see them for two weeks. Why? They're busy doing other stuff. And friend, if you're not called to the ministry, it's okay to be doing other stuff. But if you're called, it's not okay to be doing other stuff. You want to be useful to God. And Milton, I, he's my son now and I'm his dad and his dad was killed and he calls me dad, I call him son. And he'll come over to my house and he'll go, I washed your car, Dad. You know, he's, he's just always doing something for God or one of God's generals. He's just always there. He's learning the right way too, friend. But if you're called, you got a constant feeling of duty to be useful to God. A person who is truly called to the ministry will be preoccupied with the work of the Lord. See, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all, say all, all in the name of the Lord Jesus. One who is called, friend, that's all they're thinking about. I got to be busy for God. I got to do something 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 for God. How many here would, with an uplifted hand would say, that is how you have felt and how you feel. I got to do something for God. Well, how is it that you can go to a church and you'll find 75% of the people? That's the last thing on their mind, doing something for God. I'm here. I'm tithing. I'm doing my bit. Leave me alone. They're not called. They are called to get a little bit holier. But they're not called of God into the ministry. I don't want them in the ministry. They'll get me killed. You don't want soldiers like that out on the battlefield. I don't want somebody out there with a gun going, <laughs> you know, with a string at the end of the gun fishing in some pond. I want them out there fighting with me. I want the called ones out there. If you're not called, get out of the ministry. Quick. 
If you don't, you're going to get shot. And then the last one is other employment seems uninviting. Other employment seems uninviting. I said other employment seems uninviting. That's not to say that secular employment is wrong. It just seems uninviting. Now, we have a young lady here tonight who's marrying a, one of my best friends, just a dear friend of mine. And he's in Russia right now. His name is Larry. And he's coming here to get married pretty soon, isn't he? When's the date? Y'all don't... When? March? Good. Can't get it any closer, can you? Just March is it. But uh, Larry is an incredible man. And I'm just, you know, you may have heard some of this, sis, but I want to tell you, he's an incredible man of God. He is a man of God. He's worked with me all over the world. I have never once seen him complain about anything. We can be eating dog and he won't complain. If I'll say, Larry, we don't have a vehicle, we gotta walk five miles, he'll walk five miles. And I'll say, then we gotta play, you gotta play, you gotta play, you gotta sing for seven hours. He'll sing and play, for, plays the guitar, sings like an angel, awesome. I'll go into a country, i say, Larry, you gotta learn these songs in this language. He'll go, okay, all right, I'm gonna learn them. And he'll start singing in other languages of the world. And I'll, I'll say to the people, How, how's he doing? They'll go, it's incredible. It's like he knows our language, and he'll be singing in those languages. Well, what a lot of people don't know, and I don't know if his mom is here tonight, but he comes from a very successful family, very successful family. And he could have anything he wants for the rest of his life. He set up his dad's business. He set up the whole computer system. Hundreds and hundreds of employees. He set up the whole computer system. He's brilliant. He is brilliant. He's one of those guys that would just be successful, period, in business, and would have millions and millions at the drop of a hat. But no, he's called of God. Now, I believe God's going to bless him. Relax. I believe God's going to bless him, and I believe, I believe every once in a while there will be a hamburger to eat. But I was there... When his father, his father's gone on to be with the Lord, when his father came up to me and said this, he said, I can't understand, Larry. I was there when he said this. He said it to me. He said, the business, it's a very successful optical business. They make glasses. It's a major corporation. And he said, the business, he said, my son, he's my son. And I said, you have other sons, but Larry is different. Larry is called of God. And I said, let me tell you something. When you're at your corporate meetings or you're at your big conventions and you're sitting around the table with all your buddies and all your peers and you're talking about business and family, you'll mention your other sons and you'll lift them up, and I respect that. But when they say... What about Larry? Or they ask about anybody, other members of your family. And when you talk about Larry, your eyes light up. And his father started crying right there in front of me. I said, you're so proud of him. Because you know what kind of guts it takes to do what he's doing. You know what it takes to turn down everything and go after God and go after souls. See, if you're called of God, other employment will seem uninviting. It just doesn't matter how many are listening tonight. I read today in Luke, just a few minutes before the revival, I want you to hear this. We're fixing to come down the other side, and it's going to come down quickly, friends, so listen carefully. Luke chapter 5, listen to this. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, this is verse 1, verse 2, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. That's not it. Luke chapter 5, I'm sorry. That was Mark. You, Luke? And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of the Lord, he stood up by the lake of Gennesaret. 
and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little into the land. Hear this, friend. And he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets broke. The net break, and they beckoned unto other partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now, see, a lot of folks stop right there, and they'll preach that as a prosperity message. I'm going to read on. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto them, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook forsook all and followed him. That's heavy, friend. Right there in black and white is what I'm talking to you about. A man that is called of God. Secular employment seems uninviting even when you just had such a draught of fish that your net broke. You leave them on the shore, and you go, Dad, Billy, Susan, it's all yours. I'm following the man from Galilee. Now, just as there are four proofs of a call to the ministry, there are also four proofs of, of a fall from the ministry, and I'm going to go through these quickly. My goodness, it's early. Maybe I'll go through them slowly. <laughs> but just as there are four calls, four proofs to a call to the ministry, if you don't have these four proofs, and there's more than this, okay, this is not exhaustive, but if you don't have these four, friend, you ain't called into the ministry. You ain't called. When I meet people in Bible schools and they're wheeling and dealing with God, Someone mentioned the other day resumes. Who mentioned resumes? John Kilpatrick. I despise resumes. Now, resumes are important, and I won't hire anybody without looking at their resume. I won't hire anyone without looking. I want to know where they've been, what they've done, and I will call your employers. I'll find out what you're made of. So resumes are necessary. But in Bible schools, you see kids coming out of Bible school, and you know what they're already thinking? Salary package. Salary package. You ever run in any of those, Larry? I mean, people that they had the, the figure, the, the, the price, what they're worth. Friend, you're not worth peanuts. You're not worth nothing. Crawl into the church and say, Pastor, 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 I'm a slime bag from BRSM. I'm the lowest of the lowest. I'm a scuzzball from Pensacola. But if you would find it somewhere on this property, you know, utilize me, be it digging a latrine, whatever. Thou findest, I will doeth for free. That sounds like somebody that's called. Where's Hector? Hector Ferreira. Donde estas, hermano? This man right here is incredible. People, don't you ever tell him you're called. Don't do that. Because he has been through hell on earth. That's why he's so successful. 
Everywhere he goes, the fire comes down, friend. I mean, any nation of the world, the power comes. I don't care what nation it is. I don't care if it's an Episcopal church. The power comes down everywhere he goes. Why? Uh, well, it started back when he was four. He saw his father shoot his mother in cold blood. And from there, the, the story starts. But when you say you're called to Hector, he'll say, so you're called of God. You want to be a pastor. He'll say, we have this room by the bathrooms. It's a janitorial closet. I want you to move in there with your wife and stay there for a year and clean the church. We will feed you, that's all. He'll separate the men from the boys just like that. Just, I've watched him do it. Some of the finest ministers in the world today have been raised under this man's ministry. He'll put them through the school of hard knocks whether they want to go through it or not. He won't wait for the school of hard knocks. He'll just enroll them right in the beginning. But just as there are proofs to a call to the ministry, there are proofs to a fall from the ministry. And we're going to reverse these, and I'm going to close. We're going to reverse these. And a lot of these things are going to make immediate sense to, to, to you. To be called, you have to have a sincere love for the Savior. To be called. You're in the ministry now. You love God. But something's happened. Something has happened. You've been in the ministry 12 years. You've been in the ministry five years. And those of you that aren't saved, I want you to hear me. When you get saved tonight, you're going to get saved right. You're not going to come wheeling and dealing with Jesus. You're going to come a broken sinner. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He shed his blood on Calvary for you. You didn't do nothing. He did everything. You're going to come and repent, get right with God. You're going to start at the bottom. You're going to become a son of God, a child of the king. But you're not going to expect anything in return but salvation itself. So the first proof of a fall from the ministry is this, a deterioration in your love for the Savior. If you're called, you have a sincere love, but now you have a deterioration in your love for the Savior. Do I have to talk tonight about marriages? Do I have to explain to you what it was like from the honeymoon for a few years and then you quit spending time with your spouse? And your love and your consecration began to deteriorate? I, I, I cringe when people always want to fellowship with other couples. I cringe. There are people and there are, you're in this room. You can't go out and have a good time unless it's with another couple. You don't know how to have a good time with your wife. You don't know how to have a good time with your husband. It's got to be with another couple. I'm telling you, friend, your marriage is deteriorating. The love is gone. The spark is gone. My favorite person in the world is sitting right there, my wife, Jerry. I want you to stand, babe. I would rather, I would rather spend time with her than anybody in the world. And if I had the choice of going out and having lunch with Billy Graham or Jerry, I'd go out and have lunch with Jerry. I love being with her. That's why our marriage is strong. Our marriage has not deteriorated. The love has not deteriorated. But many of you that have been called of God, remember what Paul said in Romans, called of God. I'm called of God. God has called me. But now you've allowed that love for Jesus to deteriorate. You were once on fire for Jesus. Now you're burned out. You once couldn't stop talking about him. Now you don't even want to talk to him. You were once infatuated with him, 
but now at times you're even infuriated with him. You remember a time that you were consumed with the Lord's desires, but now you're overwhelmed with your own. You used to read your holy Bible. Now you read unholy books. You reach for magazines about the world instead of meditating on the word. You used to have a quiet prayer time, but now you have noisy party time. You used to love the things Jesus loved, but all that's changed. There has been a deterioration in your love for the Savior. You have lost your spiritual appetite. Don't forget the warning in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. I remember what it was like when I first got saved. It was so new. You remember it? Remember when you first got saved? Wasn't that wild? God loves me. He's with me. Man, I was a soldier. I mean, I was just a man of faith and power. Everywhere I went, signs and wonders. Man, I'm just, I'm talking not big stuff, little stuff like parking places at Kmart. You know, I would, I would just, I would believe God. One of my favorites was when my mom was with me one time and, you know, we were driving around the parking lot of Kmart and there was no places anywhere. And I said, Mom, trust the Lord. God's going to give us a place right up front because I'm a child of the king. I was so infatuated with Jesus. I would just talk straight to him. I'm going, Jesus, you know my mom. She doesn't need to walk a long way. And you know me. I want a place right up front. So Jesus, open up that spot. Sure enough, boy, out would pull a car and we'd just zip right in. My mom would go, and I'd go, Mom, I serve Jesus and he loves me. Jim, you remember the toilet paper situation? <laughs> this man, I hated you and I loved you, if that's possible. But this man, even if he had money in his wallet, would hold it back and make us pray. I was in his ministry for a year, then we came back and worked, but there was a time we were out of toilet paper. And we loved God with all our hearts. We loved Jesus. And we had to believe him for provisions, and we would believe him for food, and believe him for clothing, and go after God. But one day there was no toilet paper, and there was 12 men in the house. And there was no toilet paper. But I had a sincere love for the saint. I love Jesus, man. And when, I, when Jim said, guys, pray, pray. Oh, friend, when you need toilet paper, <laughs> nothing else matters. Trust me. You're on your face going, Jesus. Charmin, white cloud, anything from heaven, send it down, send it down. It can be two ply, it can be one ply, we don't care. Send it down, Jesus. Oh, Father, you know. When I got saved, friend, I was like that, friend. We just trusted God for everything, just fanatics. People even thought I was a fake. I was so real. <laughs> but you remember this, friend, Jim? A guy down the road comes running down the highway. He was in prayer. He's reading his Bible. He comes running down the road about a half mile away, knocks on the door, and he's holding a roll of toilet paper. These are the kind of things that I grew up on. Friend, if you can believe God for toilet paper, you can believe God for anything. But 
that you were once infatuated and just totally enthralled in the love of Jesus. He was all your thoughts, your imaginations, your dreams, but now that's deteriorated. It's, we, it's, it's whittled down now, friend, and you're just but a shell, but you're still operating in the ministry, but you don't love him anymore. It's going to get deep, and then we're going to close, friend, but I want you to hear me. I'm concerned for many of you within the sound of my voice, many of you in the overflow, you in the balcony, those of you at home. The Bible says, in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That's found in Matthew 24, 12 and 13. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Remember the call? Now this is the fall. Your love is deteriorating. You know what that'd be like with Jerry? That'd be like saying to Jerry, see, we go out on dates every Monday. It'd be like saying to Jerry, you know, honey, let's just go out once a month. Once, every Monday, we're just really busy. You busy? Well, yeah, well, I'm real busy. Every Monday. That would start a deterioration, Jerry, of our love for one another. But you've done that with Jesus. You used to go after God in Bible school with all your heart. Now you're in the ministry. You ain't got time for him no more. Your love has deteriorated. He used to be everything to you. Now you're more concerned about the deacon board than you are Jesus. You're more concerned about that big tither in your church than you are the God that gave you breath. Your love for Jesus has deteriorated. Your affections have gone other places. And the next one is this. Charity, in just a minute, you're going to come up. A feeling that the ministry... This is the fall. You've already lost your love for the Savior. A feeling that the ministry is an intrusion, and it's interfering with your personal plans and dreams. You remember you used to have a deep sense of recognition that you were not your own, that you were bought with a price, but now you have a feeling that the ministry is an intrusion. It's interfering with your personal plans and dreams. You used to be just thinking about God and your duty for God and what you can do for God, but now things bother you. He used to call the shots, but now he's invading your privacy. You want the throne back. You want control. I have seen this too many times to count. You can feel it when you're around people like this. They're still in the ministry. You want to know why? It's all they do. They got a paycheck coming in, John. It's all just a salary. It's a salary package. But everything's an intrusion. You used to be on fire. Give me souls or I die. And now, don't bother me. My favorite sitcom is on. The Lord is an intrusion. I see this in people in the ministry all the time. They look for reasons not to minister. They look for things to occupy their time. They'll look for 18-hole, 36-hole golf courses rather than 9-hole. Why? Because if they can just stay gone for four and five hours, that'll be that much less of the day that they have to deal with humans. Everything is an intrusion. Careful, friend, you're falling. You've lost your love to the Savior. Now... God is an intruding in you. He just wants you to minister to your neighbor, but things you're so busy, things are so you're so occupied with the things in your in your own on your own agenda, you don't have time for God's. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen this. And look this way, friend. These are the adulterers I pray for at this revival. Careful. These are the adulterers that I pray for. 
One night I was taking up an offering. Say, I want to take up an offering for Hector one of these nights. He's leaving out soon. I want to give him $10,000. I want to give him, a, I want to bless him. He's trying to buy a theater down in Argentina. And I want to bless him. He's broke. I want to bless him. Somebody here is helping him buy a bus. We're going to help him buy a bus. But I want to help him with that theater. And I don't know how to do it. But we're going to, somehow it's going to happen. But one night I was taking up an offering. And I was taking up an offering for another drug rehabilitation center in town called New Hope Home. I was taking up an offering. And I told everybody there, I want to give these people $10,000. But it was Friday night. And on Friday nights, the only offering Steve Hill receives. And if we don't get a certain amount, we hurt. See, I don't take any other offerings. And I don't travel a lot. Pastor knows that. I've turned down everything for years and years and years. I could have five times what we have financially right now. But we've turned everything down. I get calls from churches of 10,000 members asking me to come preach. And I say, no, I can't do it. No, I'm at Brownsville. They'll say, just one Friday night. No, I'm going to be at Brownsville. I'm going to be at Brownsville. And I know I'm turning down $50,000 to go out to that church. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but that's just the way it is. We've been committed to this for five years. And this man, I, I said to the whole church, I want to give $10,000 to them, but also we need it for our own ministry, so this offering has to be phenomenal. It has to be an incredible offering to be able to give that other ministry 10000 and also keep our ministry floating. And I said, if you have a problem with this offering, I want you to stand to your feet. And a man right over here in front of thousands of people stood up and stared me down. And I went, thank you very much. You may be seated. And some people were so infuriated, infuriated by him that he had the nerve to stand up. The preacher wants to take up an offering for a drug program that's ministering Jesus, and he stands up and he's against it. But he does. By the way, the offering was phenomenal. I believe the reason it was is because that guy stood up. <laughs> Maybe we need to have somebody stand up tomorrow night, you know, whenever we do this. But, but then... The next night shocked me. The next night, I give the altar call. And right here, all these chairs will be gone in just a few minutes. Right here was a man dressed in a nice suit, and he was doing this. And as I got closer to him, very handsome man, as I got closer to him, I recognized him as the one who stood up Friday night. And he had tears in his eyes, and he said this. I am a pastor, and he named the denomination that he was a pastor of. He said, I've been in adultery for 16 years. My lover got saved here six months ago, and he said, I can't live in sin anymore. See, friend, do you see the cycle going down? He was called of God, and now he lost his love for the Savior. He started falling into sin. Everything was an intrusion. He wanted to spend time with his lover, not his people. He'd rather be at a cabin on the lake with his lover than be ministering the gospel to the lost at some jail somewhere. You're falling. I'm warning you. You're falling. You're going the other way. This is why Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. One man said, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Go preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no man, having put his hands to the plow, is, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. He was warning them ahead of time. 
he saw that deterioration. He saw the loss of the desire to be dutiful to God. All these reasons start coming into play. When people come up to me, pastor, they say they can't come to revival because they're busy with their family. My Lord Jesus, bring your family to revival. My family's here night after night. And they say, we got to spend family time. Huh, yeah, family time. It's a cop out. What they're saying is, I don't want to go after God anymore. Go over to their house and watch them having family time. One thing I loved about Robert Murray McShane, and you'd be arrested today for doing this, but Robert Murray McShane in Dundee, Scotland, used to walk around the neighborhood, and he would hide in the bushes, and he would listen to what was going on inside the house. And then that's where he would get his material for his sermons on Sunday. People, people were amazed at his wisdom. <laughs> It was like, how did he know? Well, he got it from the horse's mouth. Jesus also said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in the name? The Lord said, many people will come unto me and say this. Have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not done many wonderful works? And then I'll, he'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These, friend, I wonder how many of these people were on fire for God in the ministry at one time. But now they're prophesying. They're doing wonderful works. But the Lord of the harvest is totally out of the picture. They're not dutiful to God anymore. They're dutiful to self. They're doing what self says. My friend, if you're going to build a church, look this way. If you're going to build a building, make sure God says build a building. I'll never forget a pastor coming to me and he said, all my life I've wanted a round church. That was the craziest thing that I had heard up to that point in my life. Once revival broke out, I lost count of crazy things I've heard. But that was the craziest thing. He looked at me like, this is just, you know, Outside of getting to heaven, a round church is really what it's all at. He said, if I just had a round church. <laughs> and he, he, he just told me, the whole, then he built the round church. Next news you know, he's in sin. Gone. Someone else is ministering in his round church. You want to know what happened to that man? He was falling. He lost his love to the Savior. He started having his own dreams, his own desires. How many are listening tonight? The ministry was an intrusion. God could have said, I want an oblong church. I want a square church. I want a triangular church. And the guy would go, get behind me, devil. Because he wanted a round church. You know what an intrusion is for some of you here? When I asked you to examine yourself, I'm asking you to examine yourself. Ministers are the world's worst. A lot, one of the reasons a lot of people don't like to get around our preaching is because we're heart preachers. We are heart preachers. I go for the juggler. I go for the heart of man. I'm a passionate man, but I'm a dying man preaching to dying men and women. This may be the last message I ever preach. And if somebody buys the tape and plays it and says, this is the last message Steve Hill ever preached, I don't want it to be frivolous. I want someone to be able to get saved listening to the last message that I ever preached. But So we speak to the heart. Listen up in the overflow and up in the balcony and those of you at home. But self-examination, we tell you to look inside. I'm asking you tonight, are you doing things that Jesus would never do? Are there videos at home that you couldn't show to your whole congregation on Sunday morning? 
Are there videos in your cabinet that you couldn't put in your church on the big screen in front of the whole church and sign your name to it? Or are there a few videos that you'd have to run home and get rid of real quick before the preacher came over? I'm speaking straight to you. You know what this is? This is self-examination, and preachers can't stand it. They can't stand it. Ministers can't stand it. They can dish it out, but they can't take it. That's why I'm not surprised when a minister falls. I'm not surprised because I've been around long enough, and I've been in a lot of homes of America, and I've seen behind closed doors. I've seen stuff in ministers' homes that is an abomination to God. It can be a good two-hour movie, but it's got five minutes of pure, raw sex. And he bought it at Walmart, and he's showing it to his family. And he's telling his kids not to pay any attention to that five-minute sexual act. It's in the home. And talk like this is an intrusion. It bothers you. One of the reasons I loved Leonard Ravenhill so much is because he never played games with me. Leonard Ravenhill was 86 when he died, and I spent three years with him right before he died. Spent the last few years, and Mike did too, Mike Brown, and he would always stick his bony finger in my face and shoot straight with me. He would say things like, be holy. On the Bible school sign, you'll see, where are the Elijahs of God? Leonard Ravenhill. If you told him you were fasting for five days, he would say, go 10. If you were praying two hours, he would say, I just finished praying seven. If you had 20 saved, he had 200 saved. So you quit talking to him like that, and you just, you just sat there. So the feeling that the ministry is an intrusion, it's interfering with your personal plans and dreams. You're falling. Now an increasing strain and a difficulty in being useful to God. An increasing strain. Write this down if you're taking notes. This is number three and I'm closing. An increasing strain and difficulty in being useful to God. It's a strain getting a new message from God. It used to be a joy to be useful to God. You did anything. Remember, you were bought with a price. But now you're following. Now it's an intrusion. Now you, you've got the throne back. And now God wants you to prepare a message. You need a mess, message. Well, I'm going to go find one in some commentary book somewhere. Everything is a strain. No fresh word from God. You used to do anything to please him. No job was too menial. No task too difficult. It used to be a call, a duty, an honor, but now it's a chore. It's a labor. It's a burden that you don't want to bear. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 14, that the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. You're no longer filled with God's desires and ways. Therefore, it is difficult to be useful to God. You would rather be in the back room, if I could just be straight with some of you, you'd rather be in the back room somebody, somewhere masturbating than going after God in a side room meditating. Sermon preparation is a chore. You're lazy. You're sloppy. Patience is difficult to come by. You've lost the anointing, so now you're lethargic. You're no longer willing to take on the test for God. You're like the foolish man in Proverbs 6 that says, there's a, lying in this, there's a lion in the streets. I can't go out there. Everything bothers you. You used to go after lions. You'd go after a bear and rip his jaw open. But now you won't even go outside. Everything is difficult. It's a strain. 
The only time you want to do something for God is when you can get something out of it. Look this way, friend. The only time you can get something for God, you, you do something for God is when you can get something out of it. A little praise, a little recognition. Well, I'll come to the Brownsville Revival and I'll baptize people. I'll baptize people so they will look at me and think I'm okay. Having the form of godliness, but denying the power. Singing on the Brownsville praise team. Singing on the BRSM praise team. Playing in the band as backslidden as you can be. But people are seeing you as long as you can do something for God in front of people. Everything's going to be okay. Oh, friend, you're so far gone, it's scary. You'll be the treasurer like Judas as long as you can dip into the bag. The call in the fall, Father, how many people am I speaking to tonight? How many, Jesus? Holy Spirit, the convictor of the soul, how many tonight have already drifted down to this abyss? They've already fallen. They're sliding, they're sliding, they're sliding, and it's your grace that has brought them to this place right now to hear your word. Want to tell you why I'm so shook up? Because there are billions of people that haven't even heard about Jesus. And you're all they got. You're it. You're Jesus to them. He's not coming back in the flesh. He chose you instead. You're the only Bible they're going to read. You're the only Christ they're ever going to see but you're backslidden. You'll serve on the deacon board as long as you can be elevated to a place of prominence. You're slid. You've fallen. So here's the pattern. A deterioration in your love for the Savior. A feeling that the ministry is an intrusion and it's interfering with personal plans and dreams. I want you to look this way, folks. You can even go to a conference. You can go to a conference. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, going to a conference is a really spiritual thing. It's a really spiritual thing, especially going to a Brownsville conference. But you can go to a conference just to get away. You can go to a conference and already have coated yourself with enough Teflon that I'm just going to go in there, I'm going to get as much as I want. As much as I want. I will not respond to those messages. I'm just going to get what I want. You can come to the Brownsville Revival Conference and say exactly that. You can come from Japan. You can come from Europe. You can come from Canada. You can come from Des Moines, Iowa. It doesn't matter. But you come just for a break in your hectic schedule and you know about sins that are going on but hey you're just down here taking a few days off chewing up the meat spitting out the bones eating what you want it really doesn't make that much difference I'm not coming down here to get changed and I know a lot of you have come down here to get changed I don't want a show of hands but you've come down to get changed but let me show you what I've seen I've seen pastors come, stand right here in front of me. I've laid this hand on their forehead. They've fallen out under the power. Got up, went over, had pastor pray for him. The power of God came down, touched by God. Mike Brown, the rest of us, we pray for him. They get prayed for a dozen times. They leave out, go back home. At 12 o'clock at night, the night they get home, they're on the internet visiting 
porno websites. Oh, it was just another religious rendezvous. I'm scared, friend. I'm concerned. So the ministry is an intrusion, increasing strain and difficulty in being useful to God. You used to find it a duty to be useful. Now it's difficult to be used of God. And the last thing, Charity, I want you to come join me. Where are you at? Come stand here. The things of this world, the things of this world, including secular employment, have now become inviting. They used to be uninviting. But don't forget about Demas. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. This is one of the followers of Paul. He was a co-laborer with Paul. You'll read about him in 2 Timothy 4.10. And he's mentioned two other places in the Word of God. Here was a man who was going after God. But now in the city of Thessalonica, he stops, he pauses, and what is growing in his heart comes to fruition. And he says, Paul, I'm out of here. A man's offered me a business, and I'm going to stop here and make me some money. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now this world seems inviting. I can tell a backslidden man in a heartbeat, friend. All they talk about is stuff. All they talk about is stuff. Just stuff, buildings, cars, houses, boats, guns, fishing, golf. I can tell them in a heartbeat, friend. You go to a restaurant, look this way, don't be distracted. You go to a restaurant, you never see them talking about Jesus to anybody. They'll never talk to anybody about Jesus. One thing I love about John Kilpatrick, is people get saved here at the revival, and you'll see a point over there and go, see that woman right there? I invited her yesterday over Red Lobster. I invited her to come to the revival. Here she is getting saved. See, this isn't just something we do in church. This is our life. Revival is life. It's something you are all the time. You're on fire for God. But it's over now. You've lost it. Now you want the things. Judas, he went after a little pocket change. What are you going after? What are you going after? What do you want? What's inviting to you? What is inviting? Do you want recognition? Friend, if you want recognition tonight, you need to repent. I'm not saying this to you to lift you up, Larry, but one of the things I love about you, brother, one of the things I love about you is you would never know you pastor 6,000 members, ever. But I'll be around pastors that pastor 400, and you'd think they were young Yi Cho. But you'd never know it. Never wants a place of prominence. Never cares. Just here to receive. Give out a little bit and receive. He doesn't have to be here tonight. Didn't he have a session today? You had your session today. What are you doing here? Just receiving. Just receiving. Growing. Receiving. Getting touched. I prayed for a, a singer right here at the revival. If I named him, you know who he is. Famous singer. Christian singer. Laid hands on him. And I didn't recognize him because there's just a mass of people. And I laid hands on him. He was touched by the power of God. And I walked over a few steps and someone came up to me and said, you know who you just prayed for? And I said, no. They said, that's so-and-so. And my opinion of that person skyrocketed. Because I talked to that person. He never told me who he was. All he said was, I need more of Jesus. Would you pray? 
Would you pray for Dallas Home? He comes through here, friend. He just sang at one of our Awake Americas in Minneapolis. He comes through here. Dallas, I mean, I'll ask, I'll say, Dallas, sing. No, no, I don't want to sing. Dallas, would you sing? Just sing. No, no, I just want to receive. Just want to receive. Remember one night, there was a, who was it up in the balcony? Um, John Starnes. How many know John Starnes? How many would believe that he could, he can carry a tone, uh, uh, he can carry a tune? He, he's got, he's got, he's got the ability. He can, he's learning. He's, he's in the back row of the balcony. John Starnes. Just coming to receive. We look at each other and pass and go, this, is John Starnes up there? Go get an usher, go up there and get him, have him come down here and sing a song. I love people like that. Reputation, who cares? But now the world is important to you. Things of the world are important. You're backslidden, friend. You have slidden away. Years ago, you'd sleep in a broom closet for Jesus. Now, you've got the whole plan. And if it doesn't meet your conditions, then God, I ain't doing it. Everyone stand. Hurry, kneel at the altar. Come on, kneel at the altar. Come on. Everything is unknown. I face the power of sin on my own. Kneel at the altar. Kneel at the altar. In the chapel, come and kneel at the altar. Kneel at the altar and ask God to wash you. Ask Him to cleanse you. Ask Him to make you brand new. Come on. Come on. He saw that I could come into His presence without fear. Friend, here at the Brownsville Revival, hundreds and hundreds are getting right with God. But what about you? What about you, preacher? What about you? There's a man watching me. It could be you, sir. You were in the ministry at one time in your life, but you allowed the things of the world to start coming into your life, and it began deteriorating your love for Jesus. And now you're a lost soul. You're as lost as the people that you used to win to win on the streets. You're lost just like they are. I'm asking you right now to get on your knees, get off that lazy boy, get off that couch, and kneel and ask Jesus Christ to wash you. Ask Jesus Christ to cleanse you. Ask Jesus Christ to make you brand new. And if you've never known the Lord, kneel. Get in front of that TV set. It's not an idol. It's an altar. And kneel and say, Jesus, wash me. Cleanse me. Make me brand new. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, stay at the altar, stay at the Are altar, come on, come on, Where come, on. Hope has come, not on. Been. come on, come on, come on, Lost in the come on, come on, come on, come on, of a lifetime of sin, come on, move lamb, move lamb, move lamb of God, move lamb of God, move lamb of God, I know a place, I know a place, of mercy for you, come on, come on, he said come on. you, to his presence without Come fear Come back to the holy place Jesus. where mercy Jesus. has first need. Wash me, wash me, Come run wash me, Come wash run me, run wash Come me, run wash me. The mercy Jesus. Jesus, Holy Ghost, don't let the Lord leave this place. Grace will be a don't let the Lord leave this place, Jesus. No Without your lay, presence, it will provide.
We're closing. We're closing. We're closing. I'm running to the mercy seat. Everyone at the altar stay right.